Hello, I'm Peggy Cornett, curator of plants at Monticello, and we're going to be talking about our, our various roses that we have in collections both at Tufton Farm, the Center for Historic Plants headquarters, and at Monticello. Uh, some of the roses are directly linked to Thomas Jefferson, the same types he was growing. Uh, but also, at, especially at the Center for Historic Plants, we have roses that were introduced uh, throughout the 19th century. Um, roses went through a, a, an amazing revolution during this, the 1800s, especially after the China roses were introduced to the West. So roses have always been a part of the landscape at Monticello. In fact, Thomas Jefferson first documented roses in his garden book entries when he was still living at Shadwell, his boyhood home. And he was recording roses at the end of his lifetime. Some of the roses are really the ancient roses of Europe and Western Asia, including the cinnamon rose. And this rose was possibly one of the suckering roses that Jefferson had planted both at Shadwell and at Monticello. Notice it gets its name cinnamon rose from the cinnamon colored stems. Alba roses are hybrids whose antiquity may go back further than the Roman Empire. Many are, uh, authorities believe they're, the albas are derived from the dog rose and the damask rose. Thomas Jefferson ordered a white rose from the William Prince Nursery in 1791. This could have been this alba rose that's growing in the oval flower bed at Monticello. In 1808, Jefferson's friend Margaret Bayard Smith sent him a letter and saying she pre presented Jefferson her compliments and was sending him some plants. The rose she was sending she called a black rose and we believe this might be in fact one of the Gallica roses called Tuscany or velvet rose. It has very deep deep red petals. Often when you find flowers that are deep deep burgundy red color uh, they're actually given the description as a black rose but of course it's not truly black and we believe that there's really only one in cultivation that could have been uh, the rose she was referring to. And it's a very vigorous Gallica rose that likes to spread with, with underground roots. It makes a nice four-foot hedge in the garden. The Celsiana is one of the ancient damask roses that we uh, have in the garden. And it's believed to be developed from an unknown Dutch breeder in the 1730s. The roses in this bed are actually from our friends at Mount Vernon when they were dividing their rose garden many years ago. The damask has a lovely pale pink flower. It's very highly scented and fragrant. Well, we're, we're standing next to a magnificent mu musk rose at Monticello. It's Rosa Moscata, the species rose, one that Jefferson intended to have here at, in the gardens. And this particular rose is historically very significant for us. It was propagated about 20 years ago from a rose that is documented to uh, stand at a historic site near Monticello and owned by a, a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson's. And that particular rose that we propagated from um, dated to 1815. And it was purchased from the same nursery, the Prince Nursery, that Jefferson obtained his roses um, in 1791. So here's a, an inc incredibly important um, specimen in our collections at Monticello, and it's just as significant as some of the uh, French chairs and furnishings in Monticello that we're preserving today. So the Rosa Mundi is a sport of the apothecary's rose and is probably the best known of all the striped roses. It originated in Europe and Southwest Asia and has a long history in gardens. Again, this was another rose that Jefferson ordered from the William Prince Nursery in 1791. The rose in the foreground is the true apothecary's rose, which is a solid, deep rose pink rose. And another rose that Jefferson likely planted in his oval beds and also at Poplar Forest. So here at the Center for Historic Plants, we have a, a series of garden spaces that are dedicated to different types of uh, plantings. Um, we, we see the Leonie Bell Rose Garden, and it really honors uh, a rose authority named Leonie Bell from Pennsylvania, who was able to help reintroduce roses that were, many of them were being lost to cultivation. And uh, this garden also 
uh, commemorates her friendship with uh, Doug Seidel, who was uh, instrumental in, in um, helping us to establish this garden back in the 1990s. Our collections at the nursery at Tufton include some of these very special rose varieties, uh, many of which are rarely in cultivation today. So we're here in the Leone Bell Rose Garden and we have this variety of China rose called Climbing Old Blush. And uh, the Rosa Chinensis Old Blush was an early um, variety or, uh, from uh, China that was introduced to the West in the uh, mid-1700s. And it became very popular because the China roses brought the quality of re repeat blooming to to roses. In other words, most of the roses that were known in America and, and Europe at that time only bloomed once in the springtime. So it was, a, it was a real sea change to have a rose that was going to continue to bloom all through the season. And the Old Blush Rose was also an important uh, variety because it became the parent of a lot of our modern uh, rose uh, varieties today, including the Noisette Rose. So we're looking at a, a large shrub rose that um, has a, an enormous amount of history to it. Um, it's, it's a musk rose, the Rosa moscata, and it's from Europe. It's a European species that uh, has long history um, both in gardens and also in literature. Uh, William Shakespeare talked about the musk rose in, in his sonnets and uh, you also read about it and, and see it in paintings. It's, it's one of our special roses at Monticello because we know that Jefferson ordered mu a musk rose from the William Prince Nursery in 1791. It was one of the, the 10 rose varieties that he ordered. The other important thing about the, the musk rose is that it was the parent of our Noisette rose, the rose that we celebrate in the Leone Bell Rose Garden. So it's a rose that dates back into antiquity, but it, it is in the blood of more of our modern roses even today. So the Noisette roses are a very special class of roses that we really feature at the Center for Historic Plants. They're really considered the first American rose hybrid. And this particular one is the, the first of its kind. Um, the first Noisette was called Champney's Pink Cluster. And the name Champneys was the name of a man, John Champneys, who lived in Charleston, South Carolina. And he was growing two roses near each other, two Euro uh, the European musk rose and the uh, newly introduced um, old blush china rose. And he noticed that there were seedlings coming up around his roses that had the finer qualities of both the musk rose and the china rose. And uh, he started growing this rose, and he, he named it after himself. He named it Champney's Pink, Pink Cluster. And this occurred in the early 1800s, uh, sometime between 1802 and 1811. But the original Champney's Pink Cluster is really considered the first American rose hybrid, the first hybrid that ever occurred in America from the crossing of a European and a China rose in his garden outside of Charleston, South Carolina. So we've talked about this first American rose hybrid that occurred on the plantation of John Champneys in Charleston, South Carolina. Apparently a neighbor of John Champneys, who had just immigrated to America from France, was a man named Philippe Noisette. And Philippe Noisette came from a family of rose breeders. So he shipped it off to his brother in Paris, and Louis Noisette developed some new hybrids from it. So we just have a number of the classic 19th century Noisette varieties in this garden, at, in the Bell Garden. I'm standing beneath a, a giant rose. It's, it's actually called the Climbing Cecile Bruner. Um, you may know it as the Sweetheart Rose. Uh, the flowers are very fragrant. Uh, they were popular during the 19th century and even in boutonnieres. Um, but as you can see, this climbing version can get 
20 to 30 feet tall. It's a massive rose. It's a beautiful rose, but there's also a shrub form that's more manageable and it would just grow about four or five feet tall in your garden. What's beautiful about the, this rose is the, the flowers are just so incredibly double and, and small. Um, and they have a beautiful pink blush to the, to the blossoms. Um, and uh, they just cover the, 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 the shrub like a shower. Um, and of course, it's, it's a once blooming rose, but it blooms for, for several weeks in the spring. This is a rose that has gone down through the ages, though, as a very popular rose for your garden. So we began planting the rose collections at the Center for Historic Plants Nursery at Tufton Farm back in the 19, late 1980s and 90s. And uh, the first beds were planted with the most ancient roses, the, the Gallicas, the Alba Roses, and some of the centifolias. These are all European roses, once blooming mostly. Now, many of these roses now are, are 20 or 25 years old, and so they're really showing some, some uh, beautiful size and, and grace. And at this time of year, it's just a spectacular sight. So the Gallica roses are, are one of the oldest class of roses. Uh, they're European, once blooming. Um, they're suckering roses, which means that they spread by underground roots and they make a nice big patch in the garden. And this is a particularly lovely one that has a study name or a found name. Um, it's called Elegant Gallica. So there's so many Gallicas that are lovely in the garden. Um, even though they're once blooming, they're certainly uh, desirable to, to have in, in any collection. Another ancient rose that we have in our collections are the damask roses. And uh, they are, again, very fragrant. Um, they, they're, although they're ancient, they probably occurred in Europe uh, after crossing with the, with the Gallica. So it may be a cross with the Gallica and the, and the musk rose. So this is a, a damask that's um, very ancient. It goes, uh, it's older than um, uh, pre-1500, we believe. And as you can see, it has just very soft, lovely, semi-double and double flowers, fragrant, and um, Jefferson ordered a monthly rose from the Prince Nursery, and he might have been referring to a damask because it will repeat occasionally throughout the season. Hi, my name is Lily Fox Bruguer. I'm the Operations Coordinator and Seed Program Lead at the Center for Historic Plants, and I'm standing in front of one of my favorite roses on our collection. This is Amanda Patinot. It's a damask rose bred um, probably before 1846 in France. And this is one of my favorite roses because it smells fabulous. Um, I wish you could be standing here with me right now because uh, it is gorgeous. And also has these lovely flowers, which are kind of arranged in these interesting four part pattern. Our roses here at the center, the ones we sell mostly in the shop, and at our plant sales locally, but sometimes online, are ones that we propagate from cuttings from our roses. So this here is a two-year-old plant. Um, the cuttings were taken two years ago. They rooted and were potted on. Um, so this is an Am Amanda Patinot rose that was grown from the plant that I'm standing in front of. So the Shaler's Provence is one of the really ancient cabbage rose varieties. And um, the cabbage roses are, are what are called centifolias, which means a thousand petals. And uh, traditionally, um, the cabbage roses do have multitudes of petals per, per, per blossom. And the centifolias were first cultivated in Europe before 1600. They're really a complex uh, combination of various ancient roses, including the Gallicas, the musk roses, the dog rose, and uh, even others. In 1791, when Jefferson ordered the large Provence rose from the William Prince Nursery, he was probably talking about one of these centifolias. This is another centifolia rose, Rosa centifolia, and this one happens to be a dwarf, and um, it's called Pompon de, de Burgoyne. And we believe it's possible that when Jefferson was talking about dwarf rose, in his garden. He might have been referring to this particular variety because it's a, a very ancient rose. It was in cultivation in Europe before uh, 1664. 
that's what was known in America and very possibly could be a rose that was in Jefferson's Gardens both at Monticello and also at Poplar Forest. Well we have a number of roses at uh, the Center for Historic Plants that are, um, are, are hybrids from wild roses that are considered pasture roses, or, uh, including the Rosa Cetigeras. Uh, those are, are uh, massive roses that, that tend to grow out in, in meadows and fields, uh, and they're native to the United States, uh, to the Midwest and even more in our area. And they tend to grow by um, rooting from the tips of their branches. So the, the branch will grow up and arc over and touch the ground and make roots and then it keeps spreading. So they, they uh, can really become quite large if, if you allow it to do that in your garden. And in the um, 19th century, uh, there were a number of uh, nurserymen who started uh, selecting and breeding some of these Rosa Cetigeras, um, these prairie roses including this particular one called um, Baltimore Bell. And it's just a particularly nice uh, pale pink uh, rose that um, does grow quite large. It can get up to 10 to 12 feet tall and it does like to spread, uh, equal amount and spread. It blooms later in the season um, and it's, as you can see, just masses of, of uh, flower clusters all over the plants, a very healthy looking rose. It's, it's very attractive to pollinators. It's a good time for bees and other pollinators that are looking to um, be attracted to flowers like this. And um, it's just one of our favorites. It is a once blooming rose, but it has a long period of bloom. And because it starts later in the spring, it really extends your flower garden quite a bit. So this is one of our massive uh, hybrid Cetigera roses that were so thrilled um, how large it's gotten. This one is called Pride of Washington and it's a hybrid Cetigera, one of the prairie roses that was developed before 1846. And uh, the beauty of this rose are these beautiful rich rose pink colored flowers that are fully double and they just cascade down um, the branches uh, all the way up this, this uh, very tall lath house. It's one of our special roses here because it was uh, a found rose that has been saved uh, and it's not it's not very commonly available. Um, it's one that's that's rather rare in in commerce and this year it's just incredibly glorious. So when you're looking at a rose and you're talking about thorns, you're really talking about, the technical term is are prickles, not thorns. And this particular rose is a, a, a moss rose. And the prickles that form on it, on the buds, are very soft and they have a, a pine scent. And um, they were very popular in the 18th and 19th century, these moss roses. When the flowers open, they're, they're actually one of the cabbage roses, a rose that Jefferson would call a, a Provence rose. And he, we know that he ordered a moss Provence rose from the William Prince Nursery in 1791. They were very popular in Europe. Again, it's another one of the once blooming cabbage roses, but this this quality of this mossing on the bud is what is so lovely about it. And uh, you can almost see a little bee uh, very interested in the glands uh, that the moss mossing must have. So you see here the, the flower is fully open now and it's, it's just packed with, with uh, petals. Um, this is an, an older variety, um, a found rose, um, but we um, you can see how there's just really no stamens in the center. It's all turned over to flower petals. Um, this is another type of moss rose. It's Rosa centifolia. Name for it, the cultivar name is called Chapeau de Napoleon. Napoleon's hat. <laughs> and this is because the mossing on this bud is so extended, it looks almost like a tricorn hat that Napoleon would wear. And then when it opens, as you can see, look at the quartering of the petals. They're all 
almost turning inward and it, as this flower opens it's going to be more and more beautiful. The flower is more fully open here and you can see how it's almost in four quarters how the petals turn in and then you get a good look at this um, Napoleon's hat <laughs> on this little bud. We're looking at the Scotch Briar Rose. When I first learned its uh, species name, it was Rosa spinosissima, but the name has changed to an equally long species name, uh, Rosa pimpinellifolia. <laughs> but it's a lovely, um, really ancient rose. It was cultivated in Britain and Europe uh, by 1600 and introduced into American gardens before, eight, before the 18th century. This rose may correspond to one, with one of Thomas Jefferson's uh, roses that he, which he ordered from the Prince Nursery um, by the name of Primrose. And what's really lovely about this rose is after the petals fall, um, you don't want to deadhead it because the hips below the petals will turn a beautiful red color. So we were looking at this, the uh, ancient single-flowered Scotchbriar rose, and this happens to be one that was found by a, a rose authority. Her name was Ruth Knopf, and so we've called it Ruth's Double White Scotchbriar Rose um, because she, she found this very highly doubled Rosa Pimpinellifolia. So this massive lath house was constructed to provide us a space where we could grow um, perennials that and bulbs that are shade loving. And uh, the beauty of this space is that it, we don't have root competition with the trees. Showering over top of this lath is a, is a rose that is quite a, a vigorous climber called uh, Arcata Pink Globe, and it's a hybrid uh, prairie rose. And so it, it puts on quite a show as well on the outside of the lath house. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, journey through our rose collections at Monticello and at the Center for Historic Plants. So stay in touch. <laughs>